This is Real Deal Sports Talk, November 6th, 2018. Yo. Denver city life, living every night, getting it. All I see is green like it's night vision. My sight's different, my type driven. These niggas risking a life, sitting over white, flipping. But I ain't with it, I'm light skinned. My mind gifted, intelligence in my disposition. Aristocratic image, and not to mention I'm nice with it. The ice drip over cardigan sweaters, tight fitting, white linen. This is the type of shit that entice women. The fly shit that I'm on is passing the sky's limits. Why it's not surprising to see that all of these guys live it. I live it, solemnly swear to I'm exquisite with the time I'm giving my mind flying to fine physics. I stay smooth like sipping out of champagne flutes. Always way cool, but it ain't a thing, just the flame crews. You blame dudes. This that shit that you can't do. That's why your main boost that he watching me, how I make moves. My high city life got me way above the clouds. Paint the audience a picture every time I draw a crowd. I hold my weight with these bars, so make no mistake. I get to cooking like Chef Curry and Golden State. Welcome, 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 welcome. This is Real Deal Sports Talk with your boy KP. It's November 6, 2018. How is everybody doing today? It's Tuesday. We got a nice little breeze going on here in Colorado. Cool temperatures, upper 40s, 50 degrees, great skies. Good day to be alive. It is voting day. I hope everybody exercised their rights today, went out and voted. You know how I feel about the system and it's broken, but I still go out and vote because the only way to make change is to affect change. I have friends, I have kids that I've mentored, that people I know that say they're not going to vote. I feel sad for them. I try to reach out to them. I try and let them know what they're missing out on, what they're creating, and how they're going to be hurt by that decision, regardless of what their current beliefs are or what path they are on. Because they're not playing the long game in what they're thinking and deciding not to vote for this election based on this, that, and the other. They're stuck in a short-term world. That's not where you live. The decisions we make today affect those of us who live tomorrow, especially our youth. So you still have time to vote. If you are in Colorado, Colorado is one of 15 states that has same-day voter registration. If you are turned away from a polling place, ask for a provisional ballot. They are required to give you one by law. You need to have a photo ID. It does not need to match your address. All that means is that your ballot will be counted last. If you get to a voting place, like in Georgia today, where all of a sudden the batteries ran out on the machines and they, oops, we forgot to bring power cords to the predominantly black voting areas. Ask for that provisional ballot, fill it out in paper, drop it off in a drop box. Your vote matters. All right, with that being said, we got a lot to talk about in sports today. Obviously, we're going to catch up on what happened this previous weekend in the NFL. We'll go over those scores, comment on a few of the games. I really want to touch on this Demarius Thomas uh, I guess it's becoming a controversy here in uh, Denver about his comments that he he made on Orange and Blue 760, a radio station here in town. I personally don't see any problems with it, but we'll go through some of those, read them, and then discuss them. Uh, There's, you know, did we have coaching changes so far? No, there's been rumored coaching changes. There's rumors about who are going to take some of these jobs, like in Denver and Dallas we want to get to. Bruce Arenas, he's made comments. James Andrews' practice is being sued. Simone Biles is setting records. And the NBA season, we got to check in on. So we got a lot to talk about, a lot to get into. We're going to start off with the games from this past weekend in the NFL. Week 9 in the NFL. These scores. <coughs> Excuse me. You had bye weeks from the Cardinals, the Bengals, the Colts, the Jags, the Giants, and the Eagles this week. I took the Raiders on Thursday night to beat the 49ers. Boy, was I wrong. That is one pathetic Raiders team. They are a disgrace to the Raiders organization, the way they are coaching, the way they are playing, the product they are putting out on that field, the way they've dismantled this team and not replaced it with talent, the way that that fan base gives and gives to that organization, and to go out there and be decimated by Mullins, 
in his first career start, his first NFL action, the way you were, you got out coached, you got out played, you had you got out hearted. It's not like the 49ers are out there killing it. This is a team that's battling injury. Nick Mullins, hello, the quarterback, first start. You go out and get beat 34 to 3. Man, if I'm a Raiders, I'm giving up season tickets right now. That 2020 year, I'm going to make them pay. That's what I'm doing. You're not dragging me along so you can get my money in Vegas. That is not what the Raiders are supposed to be about. And then afterwards, they get rid of Bruce Irvin because, you know, pass rushers are hard to come by. Bears go out and decimate Buffalo 41-9. to Panthers in their divisional matchup. All over the Buccaneers, 42-28. That offense is finally waking up. You see Chris Samuel getting more involved. You hear Cam Newton's name now being mentioned as somebody who should be talked about for the MVP. Maybe not a leader, but in the conversation with the way he's playing this year. And I have to agree. I think this is one of Cam's best years as an NFL player. On par with, if not better than his MVP season. Chiefs do their thing and handle the Browns 37-21. Sam Darnold, the rookie sensation quarterback that's so amazing. Look how he's tearing up the league. Yeah, four picks lose to the Dolphins 13-6. Steelers go out and beat a Ravens team 23-16 to kind of take control in that division, especially if Cincinnati is going to be without A.J. Green for any period of time. You still hear talks about John Harbaugh maybe being released, about Lamar Jackson maybe getting starting time, depending on how the season goes. On the opposite side, James Conner is a stud. He is a beast. He is making it so Le'Veon Bell is not missed for that team, and that's weird to say because what Le'Veon brings to a game is a lot of mismatches. James is its heart. It's physicality. It's want to. Different style guys, both super productive. But his play is making it so Le'Veon Bell is not really missed by this Steelers team right now. The Lions go out. They give up 10 sacks, 17 hits. They gave up more sacks than they scored points. Nine points. They hold Kirk Cousins to 164 passing yards. They hold their offense to 17 points. And they lose 24-9. to Stafford tries to make a play at the end of the game. I get it. You're trying to make a play. You're sick of being hit. You've been hit all freaking game long. Again against the Vikings. You see your running back right there. He's the position player. He's the playmaker. Ten times out of ten, though, you can't make that play. So Stafford's catching slack. Again, we're in this ultimate team sport and quarterbacks like Keenum and Stafford and whoever. You either catch all the slack or you get all the praise. It's the ultimate team sport. That's why you can't pick a GOAT at any one position. This argument now, who's the GOAT, Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady? You can't. The talent level's not the same on both teams. The coaching isn't the same on both teams. The way they manipulate the salary cap and bring players in and out are not the same on both teams. You're comparing apples and oranges within the same environment. But the Lions should be ashamed. That was pathetic. All around, again, that was like the same kind of performance when they came out against the Jets in week one. You came out with nothing on the field. You made no adjustments. Your offense was basic, boring, didn't catch anybody off guard. You didn't go to any kind of quick pass with all the pressure they were able to get. You didn't go to try and start a running game with some physicality, bring in a fullback if you have to, while they're having that much success pass rushing. They need a – don't get rid of Jim Bob. Make him the quarterback coach and bring in a real offensive coordinator. Because Jim Bob's good at developing those guys. He's good at working with the guys, communicating with the guys. They like him in the room. But he was not ready to be the offensive coordinator. I liked the idea because of his relationship with Stafford. But this team needs to start playing better. Some of these offensive linemen, even though they haven't given up a lot of pressures until this week on the season, they're not playing that consistently and that well. TJ Lang is beat up and hurt. My guess is he retires at the end of this year. 
Wiggins is not a competent replacement. Decker took a step or two back from his rookie year. Ragnow's coming along nicely. Gazglau, we'll see. But that performance by the Lions, just embarrassing. Really embarrassing. Falcons go out and beat Washington 38-14. to The Broncos, with every wrong decision you can make as a coaching staff, lose to the Texans, who they clearly should have beat, 17-19. to you kick a 62-yard field goal with 28 seconds left. You miss. That gives them the ball in plus territory. They make one or two plays. They're in field goal range themselves with time to make a kick. They do that. Six-point swing at the end of the first half, all on the coaching staff. Then, <coughs> oh, excuse me. at the end of the first half, or the second half, your clock management is crap. You've got about 30 seconds left on the clock, and instead of downing it and giving yourself a third down play to get more yards so you can either make it better, an easier kick, or just throw it away, you decide to huddle, run a horrible running play to get it to the side of the field you want it on, and then kick a 51-yard field goal. Now, I've heard Vance. I've heard what he said. You're not going to get something else out of the coach. They're not going to come out afterwards and go, well, yeah, really screwed that one up, didn't I? No, they had a game plan. They had a decision. They're going to man up, and they're going to own that decision when they talk to the media. But the fact of the matter is both of those decisions, the coaching stuff, was horrible. And it goes to show that Vance is not ready for that. He was not a dominant coordinator. He was not a, uh, a seasoned coordinator who had multiple years under his belt. He had one year in Miami as a coordinator where his team was 26th. He was the wrong choice again by Elway. And Mike Evans, I have to agree with you, man. There was... If Pat Bolin was not battling Alzheimer's, none of this would be happening in Denver. Elway would not have the control he has. Joe Ellis and this trust, now that I think more about it since Boland's brother filed suit against them, have not been doing and running this team the way Pat Boland would have wished for it to happen. And they had the blueprint because he was doing it up until about four or five years ago when they slowly started to, you know... Release. he slowly started to give up some of that power and control in everyday operations to other people. But if he could understand what was going on with this team right now, that they're not making the changes they need to make in the personnel department, that they're hiring the wrong people, that they're making these bad draft picks, he wouldn't be happy. And this, again, like Mike Evans said, this, I agree, this wouldn't be happening if Mr. B was still doing his thing. So, embarrassing loss for the Broncos. It is what it is. Bad teams find ways to lose. Chargers go into Seattle. They get that win. They're looking really good on this season. Solid in that wild card spot right now. Seattle did not look as physical against the Chargers as they did the previous week against Detroit. The Rams and the Saints... I picked the Saints in this game. The Saints go out and win 45-35. to They were up 35-14, I think, at half. 35-17 at half. Uh, what an offense performance. All the talk about Patrick Mahomes and Showtime and he's the clear-cut MVP and Todd Gurr. No, the MVP of the NFL right now is Drew Brees. And he is proving that week after week, year after year. He does not have a regular season MVP, if you can believe that. Right now, in my mind, halfway point, Drew Brees, MVP of the NFL. What he's doing, again, didn't have Mark Ingram for four games. Defense is not stopping anybody. You're just outscoring the world. And you go and you outscore this Rams team? Kudos. Impressive. Very impressive. 
Patriots, they beat the Packers on Sunday night, 31-17. to Basically, they just schemed the Packers right out of the game in the fourth quarter. It could have gone, you know, either way really going into the fourth quarter. But after that, the Patriots said, look, we're going to stop messing around with you. We've got enough now from our, our tape and our game planning and seeing what's going on in this game. Here's what we're going to do. Game's going to be over. And they did. They went out. They ended it. This quite possibly, unless the Packers somehow get better this season and get a bunch of luck, more than likely the last time Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers are on the same field. And then Monday night, the Cowboys, in another embarrassing loss, uh, they lose to the Titans, defensive-minded Titans, 28-14. to Bird goes to the star to celebrate his interception. Byron Jones, respect for defending the star and your home. Um, but Dak Prescott goes out once again and shows he is not the man. I don't care what kind of rookie year he had. His rookie year, they didn't open up the playbook. His rookie year, they had Brian Callahan running that offensive line. His rookie year, they had the best offensive line in the league by far. His rookie year, they had Ezekiel Elliott toting the rock for 1,800 yards. Real easy not to make mistakes in that situation. Real easy when you're playing uh, uh, play action and run pass option the whole time, and you can decide if you're going to run the ball most of the time instead of having to pass. Dak Prescott is not an NFL passer. He may be an NFL quarterback, but he is not an NFL passer, and he's never going to be. They tried to force stuff to Amari Cooper. He got his touchdown early and disappeared. Zeke was going off, 96 total yards from scrimmage in the first half, six less than 10 touches in the second half. I think it was six touches. Bad coaching, embarrassing Dallas is not the team. Skip Bayless is bailing on him now, throwing his jersey and his hat in the trash. I know it was for show, but I mean... And then even Troy Aikman's coming out, and and he's Mr. Cheerleader for this team, like Michael Irvin, and saying, you know what, the whole thing needs to be redone. Blow it up, start from scratch. So that's week nine. Week nine had all kinds of storylines like that. Another one they had, or this, this interview Demarius Thomas had, with orange and blue on 760 here in Denver. Now, I don't have these comments that I want to talk about laid out in the order that they were made in the interview. If you want to listen to the interview, if you want to read the interview, you can go do that. It's out there. Check it out. Orange and blue 760. I think it's even on uh, the Broncos website, if I heard correctly. Um, but he wanted to basically, he wanted to clear up uh, the the headline that was out there that Houston was about winning, making it sound like Denver didn't care about winning, and Houston did. And that was a big difference in a a three-day experience before he played Denver. So he said, but there's one thing I do want to clear up because there's something out that's saying I said something, but it wasn't in a way, wasn't in the way it was. It was like, that's the way they do over there. They lose, and we win over here. It's not that. It's not that I was taking shots at the players or anybody. I wasn't taking shots at nobody. But if you want to be better, you got to listen to your players. They've been playing this game for a long time. And when you don't change stuff up on the field, there were games where I wanted to change stuff up on the field because I saw it and I knew it would help us. I used to do it with Peyton. It helped the offense. I just try to make us better. But when you don't want to listen to the players, that's what's going to happen. It's the truth, though. It's a great organization, man. On a sheet of paper, that team right there, they got a special squad. Ain't no way they should be losing that many games. Okay, let's stop right there and just dissect that. So he clarified the statement that was put out there by Michael Silver who, that made him look like a, an asshat, a complete jerk. So the way it was reported wasn't true. And a lot of times that happens. You got to have context. And if you're not providing the right context, you're making these players look horrible. Do you want to listen to your players and what they're seeing out there on the field and take that into how you call a game? Yes, you 100% should be because they're out there seeing it. You can do whatever you want from the box and think you can see whatever you want from the box. If you're not down there on the field running the plays, seeing the little things you can't see from the box or the sideline, 
and you're going to ignore the, the insight that's being given to you, you're a bad coach and you're a bad coaching staff. He made sure to let it be known. He's not talking about the players. They got a lot of talent. They should be winning more games. Talking about whether or not he was being tr traded. When he said to me, I said, how is it not true? My agent called me today and said Elway wanted a fifth round pick for me. So we're telling stories to each other now. I thought we were going to be man about this. Listening to that from him and then another couple of coaches coming up to me saying, it's all fake, it's all fake, and then it really happens. It's like, man, it is what it is, though. Talking about the coaching staff and Vance Joseph, and basically Elway, too, telling him, look, don't worry about it. You're not going to be traded. And this goes back to before the Kansas City game. He says, you know what bothers me? I don't want to stir any pot, but it bothers me. I had people from Denver saying, like, they really said they got rid of you because you were the problem on offense, and they said they wanted to do to better the offense. I'm like, really, bro? I heard they were saying that Vance was saying something and Elway was saying something. I did so much for this organization. I never had nothing bad to say about anybody. None of the players I played with. I just did my job and kept it as professional as I could. For you all to say that I was one of the reasons that the offense wasn't going and say this and that, man, it, that hurt. He said, my receiver coach came to me and said he could have said this and he could have said this to any, to either Cortland or Emmanuel, but he came to me and said it. He said, I want to get Deshaun in the game more than one rep. I want to get him going four to six plays of reps. I'm like, bro, I've been here nine years, and you ask me besides anybody else? I'm like, that's so disrespectful to me because I've put in so much into this game, but you want me to come out for a rookie. I don't have anything against it because he's a great player. I love Deshaun Hamilton to death. When I knew it was that, I was like, I'm out of here. I'm out here just to be out here. It was tough. So does he want to play? Yes, he wants to play. It hurts that people are scapegoating him as if it's his fault. As if the ultimate team game comes down to the performance of one player. Has Demarius had drops? Yes. But 9 times out of 10, I'm taking him over any receiver they have on the roster. And they've got a talented group. Now, he wasn't a big talker. He wasn't a look at me. He wasn't a publicity guy. You don't see him here and there doing all this stuff on TV and performing. He's a quiet, reserved guy. So maybe that's why he got all the slack he got. Because he didn't come out. And he wasn't so vocal after a drop. And he wasn't so vocal after being the only player in the Super Bowl against Seattle to do anything competitive and have some heart. He's a stud, and he's the best receiver in the history of the Denver Broncos. McCaffrey might have done his thing. Marlon Briscoe might have done his thing. Rod Smith might have done his thing. The three amigos might have done their thing. But by all means, Demarius Thomas is the gold standard when it comes to Broncos receivers. Don't want to come out for a rookie. You didn't ask anybody else. It wasn't like, hey, guys, let's group up. We want to get him some more plays. Just letting you know we're going to be mixing up personnel groups. You approach one guy, again, making it seem like, dude, you're the one. Singling him out, even through his coaching staff. He says, even leading up to the Kansas City game, it was tough because that Monday I didn't say anything to anybody. I walked in to the job and head coach Vance Joseph walked up to me and he said, don't listen to the trade talk. It's not true. Before the season started, the trade talk was still going and nobody said anything to me. So why come to me Monday when it's the same talk? When he said that to me, I said, how is it? How is not true? My agent called me today and said, L.A. wanted a fifth round pick for me. So are you telling me stories to each other now? I thought we were going to, 
to be men about this. He said, leading up to Kansas City game, that's when all this started. The emotions, everything. Because I knew it was something. I knew something was going to happen. But I still had to grind it out and play that game and get through it because I didn't know. I played that game like I was going to be here. So are you kidding me? You th- what do, you, do you think he's stupid? Like I get as management, you're not going to you know tell a player we're thinking of trading you because you don't want that player to drop off. You want them to be performing at their top peak so you can try and get the most for them. That's the business, the ugly side of it, the side where you are definitely lying to the player to get what you need out of them. But do you really think coming into that game, where he is grinding it out, knowing he has to come to work and block this noise out, and everybody's telling him, don't say it, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. That he doesn't know what's going on? Give him more credit and the respect that he's due. He said, when they started booing me, I kind of figured soon my time's coming up because I'm the only player getting booed, and I've been here the longest. And then on the other... Like, man, I've been here nine years, and I can't even be a captain. It affected me a lot because before we even chose captains, I went upstairs and had a conversation with Mr. Elway. Kubiak reached out to me one day. Elway was just telling me how he wanted you and to be a leader in in another way because usually I'm on guys because I know guys are better than what they are and what they put on film. I want guys to go out and fight like I do every day. I don't care for winning or losing. You have to put your best ball on film because if you don't, you're not going to be in this league a long time. I was on guys, and I guess they didn't want it in that way. But then I had the meeting. I was like, okay, I'm going to be a captain again. I go to the meeting room, and it's like every player came to me, and we're like, how are you not a captain? We picked you. It's like, man, it's all good. I'm going to be here for you all. I did whatever I had to do to make sure Cortland Sutton was right, Deshaun Hamilton, Tim Patrick, Isaiah McKenzie, even defensive guys from Brendan Langley, Ike, all of them. I just want guys to be great in this league. I wasn't trying to start something with nobody. I wanted everybody to be good on the squad because it was making us better as a team. If I can't be a captain, it was just heartbreaking. He was a captain last year. Mind you. And these words are in hindsight, fresh off of being traded less than seven days ago. But the fact of the matter is, if the players are telling him, man, how are you not a captain? We voted for you. And the organization is telling you another thing and stringing you along. The Broncos did Demaryius Thomas wrong. They made the wrong decision again. That pick is not helping them this year. All the chatter... All the lies. Oh, yeah, don't worry. It's fake news. It's the whole time knowing that you're trying to shop him because you think your young athletes are going to develop the way he did from being a young athlete. Cortland Sutton got a whole bunch of reps this week. I didn't see him shoot off tape. I didn't see him blow nobody up. He didn't jump out of the world and make the game when he catches and score a couple touchdowns, all kinds of yards and catches. I think he was targeted five times. He played near 80% of the snaps. So if he's your young stud, you got to trade your team's captain, your team's favorite player, your team's leader, the locker room guy for. And you're going to give him less than 10 targets on a game? When that's the guy you had to get in after stringing Demarius along? Come on. Now, I'm not trying to be down on Sutton. He is a talented kid. He can develop into a a great receiver. Deshaun Hamilton can develop into a great receiver. The Broncos had a very good draft class that I think most of the players are going to develop out very, very well. But they continue to make these boneheaded mistakes. These stupid, stupid mistakes. Like a bad team would. And that would not be happening, like Mike Evans said again, if Mr. B was in his right mind. Now, 
Elway says they're staying pat at the coaching position. They're not going to go ahead and get rid of Vance Joseph. He says he feels better about it this year than he did last year. Okay, great. You feel better about it. You're not getting better results right now. You have a better roster, and you're not getting better results. You're not getting great play calling. Again, they went away from the bootleg game this week that was so successful for them against Arizona and opened up the offense. Now, you don't have Royce Freeman back yet, but Booker's playing pretty well outside of the fumble that he had. So Elway says we're staying pat. Now, there's been, you know, today they were talking about should they go after John Harbaugh if he's released. Uh, I've heard Mike McCarthy if he if he's not in Green Bay next year. What about uh, Jim Harbaugh or one of these other college coaches that are being mentioned, like uh, uh, Lincoln Riley? I think with the talent Denver has right now, if you bring in either Harbaugh, you're an instant playoff team. I don't really like Mike McCarthy as the head coach. I think he needs to focus on being an offensive coordinator. In fact, I think McCarthy probably needs to move to the booth or to one of the networks to be talking about the game. Dallas. They're not making a coaching change, Jerry Jones says. Now, then again, somebody pointed out today, in 2010, on November 5th, Jerry Jones ruled out an in-season coaching change, just like he did um, this year on November 5th. Yesterday, he ruled out a coaching change. However, in 2010, by November 8th, he made an in-season coaching change, and that's when Jason Garrett came in. So we'll see. Who knows? In a couple days, Jerry Jones could be firing Jason Garrett. Aikman wants a complete overhaul of the complete organization, and he is Mr. Cheerleader for the team, so that's surprising. Names being floated already for that coaching job. Matt LaFleur, Josh McDaniels, John DeFlippo, Lincoln Riley again. Bruce Arenas is out there saying that the only coaching job he would come out of retirement for is the Cleveland Browns. So that is going to be a hot destination for a head coach this offseason. Teams, coaches are seeing the amount of talent they have built there, the cap room they have, the number of picks they have collected. It's going to be interesting to watch Cleveland this offseason and see what happens with their coaching position. Uh, Dr. James Andrews' practice is being sued by former Minnesota Viking defensive tackle Sharif Floyd for over $180 million for a surgery he's claiming ended his career. Sharif Floyd was a beast. If he was still on that Vikings team, I can't imagine how dominant they would have been. And when I heard about the knee injury and how he almost lost the leg and couldn't walk, and it was, I was surprised. Because I don't remember him having a big injury. I remember him having an injury. It seemed like a simple surgery. And, you know, people take surgeries so many different ways. The way you react and the way the body heals. And it's really unfortunate that his career had to come to an end the way it did. With Dr. James Andrews' track record, though, it, I think it's going to be hard to prove any kind of medical malpractice for his team to get that amount of money out of this situation. Uh, he's had way too many successful surgeries. Not every success, not every surgery is successful. Some don't take. Maybe they did screw it up, and that's the reason he's not going to be able to play. I also think it's going to be hard to prove that he was going to make another $180 million in his career with the way injuries happen and the link, average length of career in the NFL. So, that's the NFL talk. Let's switch and take a quick look in at what is going on in the NBA. So, young NBA season. It's been exciting. Toronto's not missing DeMar DeRozan right now. They are 10-1. and one. Kawhi Leonard is, you know, leading that team very well. Uh, Milwaukee with Giannis, 8-1 and one right there in the east behind Toronto. And then the other six teams in the top eight right now. You have Indiana, Boston four, Philadelphia, Charlotte, Miami, and Detroit. Probably still those eight teams at the end of the year 
Maybe Miami falls out and one of these other teams gets hot. Uh, Cleveland, hey, you're one and nine, basically losing LeBron James. Yes, Kevin Love's out now, uh, but that just goes to show what he brings to a team. And it hasn't worked out yet so far with L.A., but believe me, they're going to get their rotations fixed. They're going to get it going, even if LeBron has to take over really coaching the team and deciding what everything is going to happen on the court. Don't have high expectations. I thought of them, the Lakers, as a four seed this year. They probably get in somewhere around a seventh or an eighth seed. On the Western Conference side, Golden State right now, they are in the first seed because they have played one more game than the Denver Nuggets, who are 9-1 and one on the season playing defense. I believe I heard the other day the average age of the players on the Nuggets is 23 years old, so they are young, they're hungry, they're athletic, they play at altitude. They have wins this year over Golden State and the Celtics now as they beat the Celtics last night. Uh, two teams that are favored to go to the finals. Charles Barkley said they were going to be a three seed. I tell you what, I'm starting to think the Denver Nuggets have a chance. If they can play like this throughout an entire season, I can see them having 50-55. I, I think 60 wins is a high ceiling for this team, but I can see 50-55 wins for this Nuggets team playing this way. Behind those two teams in the West, you have Portland. San Antonio is in fourth seed right now. Clippers, the Kings, who are playing really well. Oklahoma City's gotten it together. Now, Russ did roll his ankle, so he's going to be missing some time more than likely. And Memphis is playing better early this season in the eighth seed. Houston's going to have to get it figured out. I'm sure the Jazz are going to start playing better. New Orleans... I think they flirt with an eighth seed, but probably don't get in. And the Lakers, you have to imagine, are going to start playing better throughout the season, even if they end up about, say, a 45 and 43 team or something like that. As far as our stat leaders currently on the NBA side, we have your offensive point leader for the NBA right now is. Steph Curry at 31.3 points per game, followed by a center, a power forward, and then two guards. Joel Embiid and Blake Griffin both averaging over 28 points per game. In fact, everybody in the top five is averaging at least 28 points per game. Re defensive rebound leaders. Uh, rebound leaders. Andre Drummond, he's at 16.3 per game. I'd like to see that be a little bit higher, honestly. I think if your main skill set is rebounding and putting back offensive rebounds, you need to be averaging 16 to 20. So he's in that 16 range. I'd like to see that throughout the season. Hassan White said, DeAndre Jordan right behind him. I think they need to pick their game up because behind them is a, a guard, Giannis. He plays guard. He plays forward. Rudy Gobert is fifth on the list. Kyle Lowry leading the league in assists at 11.5, followed by Chris Paul at two less per game, 9.3. JaVale McGee leading the league in blocks at 3.4. I'd like to see his rumored potential backup, Tyson Chandler, also be on this type 5 list. That will greatly help the Lakers as they are dead last in defense right now in the NBA. Um, field goal percentage, Rudy Gobert. He's always going to be right up there. Most of his shots are dunks. And Paul George leading in steals at 2.5 plus per game. So that's a quick look in on the NBA. That's where they're at. Uh, quick note and salute and shout out to my girl Simone Biles. Becomes the first American to win a medal in every event at the World Championships. So not the first woman. Not the first African American. The first American, period, to win, in every, to win a medal in every event at the World Championships. This year, she is something special. Uh, I also heard she was um, competing with a kidney stone. So for everybody who out there who's dealt with that, go do some gymnastics while you're dealing with it. And to speak of, even though she had this great accomplishment, the U.S. gymnastics may be kicked out by the United States Olympic Committee, the USOC. Um, 
because of all the stuff that's been going down with the leader of the U.S. gymnastics and the stuff at Michigan State and all the fallout that continues to happen with that. That would be too bad to see. I think our athletes deserve better, and I hope that the USOC does not go that route. Um, but we'll have to see what their punishment and how they decide to handle it comes down. And then Rob Reiner Reject lies, vote truth, reject ignorance, vote for science, reject corruption, vote for the rule of law, reject racism, vote for inclusion, reject hate, vote for love, vote. And that's real. Until next time, be real. Dear Reverend, I can't believe you damn near seven. I wrote this letter to tell you that you a real blessing. And I don't even believe in heaven with the exception. If it's really real, then no question that you would be the essence. You the best thing that happens since I met your mama. Nothing makes me happier than the honor of being your father. Ever since Shatana laid up in the labor room, I can't believe how much a new baby could really change a dude. You was a planned birth, walk around with diaper bags like a man purse. I was prouder than any man on earth. Your first birthday, time flies in the worst way. Cause just the other day, you was trying to climb out the learning cage. Now you running and jumping, laughing with so much joy and the greatest satisfaction than what you holding your baby boy. Star Wars, dinosaurs, all the latest toys. I give it to you all, anything you could ever ask me for. I send a kite to the loved ones within my life. Cause you're the inspiration for which I write. Sincerely yours. To my dogs who rep the squad. From day one, we're saying thanks, bruh, for embracing love. Sincerely yours. To all the fans who keep records spinning like silly fans and giving us a chance, your extended fans. Sincerely yours. When I'm falling, my physical form is dead and gone. You can play this song in memory of. Sincerely yours. Dear mom, I'd just like to thank, thank you, you for being strong. You could have gave up, but you just kept pressing on. Lost most of your vision, but I wanted you to see. Deep down inside, what you really mean to me. Bend, but don't break. Don't ever get it confused. The survivor of the physically and mentally abused we are all god's children but you are like an angel my whole being formed in your womb and i'm thankful long hard hours on the grind in a bus but you always found time to take care of all of us i'm not rich with money i'm wealthy because you taught us always exercise and eat healthy no father around so i should have been a fool but instead got a full ride scholarship to school always tried your best never gave us bad advice in the dictionary see your picture next to sacrifice sacrifice I love you. I send a kite to the loved ones within my life because you're the inspiration for which I write. Sincerely yours. To my dogs who rep the squad from day one. We're saying thanks, bruh, for embracing love. Sincerely yours. To all the fans who keep records spinning like silly fans and giving us a chance, your extended fans. Sincerely yours. When I'm falling, my physical form is dead and gone. You can play this song in memory of. Sincerely yours. Sincerely yours. Sincerely yours. Yours, silly, yours.